um, <laughs> behind hedges <laughs> for balls in the morning. Yeah, not this week, though, <laughs> Corin. Not this week. <laughs> Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Corin Crane from the, from the Black Country Chamber of Commerce. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this morning. This is a bit of a historic moment, I think. We can't remember when all, all, all six chambers in the West Midlands have all bun, done an event together. Um, so if there's one positive thing that COVID's done, it's, it's brought us all together like a proper West Midlands community that we are. Um, the format of the morning is going to be an hour long. We will finish exactly at 11 o'clock, so we'll, we'll cut people off if, if that's the case, because I know that they, one of the, the nice things about COVID is we don't, we don't need to drive everywhere, but we, we pack in meetings all day long, don't we? So I understand most people on the call have a meeting at 11 o'clock as well. So the format will be is um, I've got a few questions to work through with, the, with, with, my, with my colleagues. Um, if you've got questions yourself, um, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, Matt will sort them all out and he'll package them up together and um, send them through for us, us to ask. If you're on the phone and you can't put anything in the chat box, then please feel free to unmute yourself and shout your name loudly and we'll come over to you if, if that's okay. A um, couple of a, a points of interest as well. We are recording today. Um, so if, if you've got your camera on, be careful what you're doing because we can see everything and you'll be on, you'll be on the internet forever. Um, and we're also trying to live stream it today as well. Um, so hopefully the technology works has been being live streamed as, as, as well as being recorded. So thank you all very, very much for that. So I'm going to, I'll call your names out one at a time if that's okay. Um, but if you could introduce yourself, your chamber and, and just tell us a little bit about your chamber if that's all right. Um, and, and Sarah, we'll, we'll start with you if that's okay. Thanks, Corin. Um, okay, I'm Sarah Williams, Chief Executive of Staffordshire Chambers of Commerce. Uh, we cover the, mainly the north of the county of Staffordshire and share the south with Birmingham. Uh, and we have a very good relationship with Birmingham so that we make sure that businesses uh, don't miss out by being caught in this odd no man's land um, of, of, of the overlap. Um, uh, we have just over a thousand members, or we did before lockdown. Uh, we run a number of programs, including the DIT contract for international trade. Uh, we have a mentoring program. Uh, we run over, uh, in usual times, about 200 uh, events a year. We're very proud of the representation work that we do. Um, and I'm pleased to see that Matt Lowe, who used to work for me, is now working for Um And uh, we think that we're a strong, uh, socially minded with a small s chamber, we believe very much that we are there for the prosperity of the people of Staffordshire and that we do that through helping businesses to grow and succeed. Brilliant, thank you, Sarah. Um, and Richard on the golf course? Yeah, what Sharon said, but I'm Richard Sheehan, I'm the Chief Executive of uh, Shropshire Chamber of Commerce, Sarah, I mean. Uh, we're obviously Shropshire based, uh, we cover the largest inland county in the country. So, geographically, we face a number of challenges uh, and it's our absolute commitment in life to reach out to market towns and around the business community of our county. Um, the connectivity of that of that county is is so important to the Midlands and so being part of our, our West Midlands group sharing the DIT contract delivery as we do is a really important part of, of the work that we do uh, and we see it as a real privilege to serve our county and to try and support economic development and economic growth and and the jobs that come with that uh, across Shropshire. I uh, have a very dedicated team. There are 17 of us, so we are relatively modestly small compared to many chambers, but uh, I believe we really punch above our weight and I'm very proud of every each and every one of them. Brilliant. Thank you, Richard. And Louise in Coventry? Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Louise Bennett. I'm the Chief Exec of Coventry Warwickshire Chamber of Commerce. Um, my colleagues will laugh at this little bit, but I'm also a Deputy Lieutenant of the West Midlands, which is really important to you guys as businesses because it's all about how we showcase the very best of business across the Midlands. Um, and I'm also the High Sheriff in nomination, so I will be the High Sheriff of the West Midlands next year. Um, so I look after Coventry Warwickshire as a Chamber of Commerce, and it is just the most beautiful area because we've got the city of Coventry and then the beautiful urban area of Warwickshire. It is like a mini England. Um, you know, we've got every sectors and segments of the economy and it's, a, it's just an amazing place to work in terms of partnership working and connectivity. It's a big area. We cover seven local authority areas, 37,000 businesses, but it really is an absolute darling place to work. Um, and much like my colleagues, we offer um, trade support, trade services, membership support. So the only thing I'll mention is where we're a little bit unique. So um, my Chamber of Commerce, and um, we have about 100 staff, we also deliver apprenticeships 
and we um, and we deliver something like 700 apprenticeships across Coventry and Warwickshire um, every year. So we've got a real um, interest um, and connectivity into the local skills base of the economy. Thanks, Corinne. Thanks, Louise. And Sharon over in Hereford, Worcester. Hello everyone, yeah, I'm Sharon Smith, Chief Exec at Herefordshire Chamber of Commerce. Um, like some of my colleagues, we've got a really large and um, rural area, so that presents its challenges. Um, the infrastructure and particularly digital infrastructure, um, so as the other chambers trying to reach out to some of those smaller businesses, um, demographic of businesses in our two counties is actually 90 to 95 percent micro businesses so they've got a real small number of employees um, but likewise we've got some major players in our area as well some of the brands that you'll probably know like GTEC and Worcester Bosch so ourselves trying to um, accommodate all those businesses large absolutely Hundreds of thousands of really small businesses. As we put on, we try to for those businesses and, and the changes that they're facing. Thank you, Sharon. Sharon, you're cutting out a little bit with your with your um, Wi Fi at the moment. I think you can shake your computer a little bit. Okay. Uh, and then over to um, to the Jupiter of the um, West Midlands Chambers. It's um, it's Paul Faulkner. How's it going, Paul? <laughs> I've certainly, been, I've certainly been called a lot worse, Corinne, so yeah. I'll, uh, I'll take that, I guess. Um, yeah, morning, everyone. Nice to see a few familiar faces and uh, some new faces as well on the, the call. So I'm Paul Faulkner, Chief Executive of the Greater Birmingham Chambers uh, of Commerce. So for us, we've got 10 sort of um, different divisions, as we call them. So Birmingham and Solihull, Sutton Coalfield, which is part of Birmingham, but uh, seeking independence. Um, and then, as Sarah mentioned, we, we've got three uh, chambers which we operate in Southern Staffordshire, Burton, uh, Litchfield and Tamworth, which operates as one, and, and Cannock Chase. And we also operate the Asian Business Chamber of Commerce, uh, two which are focused on uh, international activity, the Commonwealth, uh, the Greater Birmingham Commonwealth Chamber and the Transatlantic Chamber. And then we have a young professional offering called Future Faces uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, lots going on. And... Um, you know, do a lot of our international activity with the, the our sort of uh, the six of us here in the region and um, keep trying to push that and a lot of focus on that right now. And certainly in Birmingham, of course, the Commonwealth Games uh, coming in, in two years is um, something we're, we're very, very mindful of and seeking to ensure that the, our businesses, and it is across the whole region really, are going to get the, the real value from that. Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Paul, we'll stick with you for the, for the first question, really, if that's OK. Um, and it's just obviously going to talk about, about COVID. I mean, um, when it all kicked off in, in March, you know, not necessarily your members, but how did you as a business sort of prepare for what was coming up with, with the lockdown? Yeah, it's hard to prepare, wasn't it? I suppose is it when we were all down at the British Chambers had their conference at the start of March when it was still very much wash your hands and... Uh, we're not going to stop any large public gatherings. We had our, our annual dinner where we get about 1,400 people together on the 19th of March. So that at that time, we were doing lots of um, hand wringing, I guess, and trying to decide, you know, would we still do it or what would we end up doing? I can't, be in hindsight, can't believe it was such a, a decision. And we, we decided to postpone it. Absolutely the right thing um, to do. But I think like lots of lots of businesses actually we've adapted really well to working from home i'd say it's been pretty seamless um the team have been been great with it we're, we're quite flexible in terms of our working uh, style anyway i'm sure it's the same with the other chambers you know we're doing lots different times of day and so our members of our sort of team members tend to be in and out of the office as and when they need to but yeah we've we've adapted well um we are we've kept our office open actually the whole way through we uh, we all process export documents and so we've had one member of staff in at all times doing that and we also we're a landlord so we've kept our office building open and now starting the process of coming back I'm in the office today and have been um, uh, on and off now for for the last little while but putting all of the the measures that we need to in place doing the deep cleans um, following the guidance um, 
and certainly in seeing as that sort of changes. But right now, I'd say 90% of the team are still working from home and doing it effectively. Brilliant. Th thanks, Paul. And, and, and Sharon, just coming over to you, I mean, I mean imagine you did, you did very similar um, things to Paul, but clearly this, this had an impact on our, on our finances chambers as well, didn't it? So how, how did you sort of start preparing the business and the board for what was coming up? We started, first of all, we thought about our members. Um, I'm not just saying that. We've got a team who really care about the accounts they made. First priority for us was... Um, um, I think we made about 2,000 phone calls um, and we just kept keeping in touch with the members to make sure they'd got all the advice they needed, they had any help and access to other to the services that we offered and like many other businesses um, we realised quickly we had to diversify not necessarily the product as much, but the channel of communication. So all of our face-to-face -face networking went online really quickly, and we've since run over. Well, Sharon, I, I might I might have to stop you. We're losing you all the time. Sorry, Sharon. It might be worth you turning your camera off, mate. Um, we've got really poor reception. Sorry. Is this We're, any better? Yeah, loads better, mate. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I was just saying we turned our attention to our services, everything online, all our networking, all our training, um, events, um, so businesses can still access the same services, but just online. Obviously, that's still difficult financially, um, as a lot of those services are now offered for free, um, but it's, it's something that uh, and I've finished now, Corinne, because you can't see me. No, thank you, mate. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just um, Louise, coming over to you, I mean, not only have you got the, the, the chamber to sort of look at, but uh, you had all those apprentices to sort out as well, didn't you? And, and how, how did you approach lockdown for the apprentices in particular? So, um, so we've continued to operate through lockdown. Um, I suspect we've got lots, lots of businesses on the call today that, um, that employ, I hope anyway, that employ and deploy apprentices. Now, a lot of apprentices were furloughed, but even though they were furloughed under the furlough scheme, as we all know, you're allowed to continue with your education and learning. So that was good news for us as a, as a chamber, as a deliverer of apprenticeships, because it meant that we could continue to deliver learning, but through remote means. Now, that's not always easy, as you would imagine, particularly with some of our vulnerable communities who haven't necessarily got access to the kinds of technology we're all used to. Um, but we've continued to deliver to our apprenticeships um, and um, um, a little bit of challenging news and a little bit of good news. A little bit of challenging news is that across the country at the moment, um, the, the take up, the start up of um, apprenticeships is 70% down. Now, perhaps that shouldn't be any surprise, but again, just to... Um, just to let our businesses on the call know, what we are doing as Chambers of Commerce is we're lobbying really hard into government to say that we need to return to those days where um, apprenticeships are subsidised, so employers are incentivised um, and can access funding to then invest in apprenticeships so that we can, we can try and tackle that complete fall over the cliff edge of apprenticeship starts but we've continued to deliver um, and then the nice news um, I wanted to mention is that we're starting to see some of the furloughed apprenticeships come back into into operation so just this week um, our Coventry Warwickshire Hospitals NHS Trust has just reinstated 35 apprentices and they're you know they're back out there working um, but yeah, on behalf of all the businesses here, we're lobbying really hard because this is going to be the time for those employer-led incentivizations and, and, and subsidies so that we can see our young people looked after over the next couple of years. And, and um, uh, Louise, yeah, just to back that up, some of the conversations we're having at the moment with our FE colleges means that they get an awful lot of the revenue, they're from commercial revenue from businesses or apprenticeship programmes, and they have the choice in September either to reduce, reduce the provision or take a big risk on numbers, don't they? Um, and we have a real danger of, of having less young people coming into our workplaces um, than ever before. 
and we need those jobs don't we at the moment um, we, d we do, because um, the, the lovely things about apprenticeships, as we all know, apprentices, is that it makes that connectivity between skills and learning and a job. Um, so they are really critical um, to the economy. Um, and another, another little worry that we have in Cov Warwickshire that won't come as a surprise again to clients um, on the call today is around the hospitality, tourism and leisure industry. Now, they're going to be worst hit by COVID-19. And yet often, and I suspect for many of us, it's the first place you go for a job and for skills as a young person. So again, you know, we've got that real lobby into government to say we need, we need more long-standing support for certain sectors and we do need support um, for employers to take on their apprentices. Yeah, thank, thank you. And Richard, coming to you now, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier on that Shropshire is just a, a huge space of land to cover um, and you don't have one of the biggest teams in the country for your chamber. How did you manage to wind things down but still keep a big presence out there? That must have been really tough. Well, uh, the, fir the first decision we took very quickly, literally day one, was that we wouldn't furlough anybody. That, that With the limited resource we had and knowing that businesses were going to need that, that support um, and to try and make sure they were fully aware of what was real and what was what was fake news. Um, we took the decision to to retain everybody um, and that that was the right thing to do for us without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, we clearly wanted to focus on on research as well to ensure that we were able to feed back to stakeholders, the British Chambers of Commerce and indeed our partner chambers, the issues that were, people were facing on the ground. It was a, a moving feast, it was moving very quickly there was so much uh, lack of information coming out from government. They were shooting from the hip in terms of the schemes they were putting in place. And we needed to be sure that where people were falling through the gaps, that our research was, was actually paying off. So, so that was a critical part and has been an ongoing critical part of the work that we've done. And I'm delighted we've been so well recognized for that work. And, and it's been informing decision making both at a local and the national level, which is, which is really important. The second thing we realised, of course, is our members were going to be taking some pain. So we immediately announced that we wouldn't take any membership fees for three months. Um, both of those decisions were very costly financially, but we decided that we would draw on our reserves to, to cover those off. And again, absolutely the right decision to make. From, from our own situation, we were up and running literally within, within a day. Um, there were a few teething problems. Uh, we realised we hadn't got pandemic in our business continuity plan. So that was a, a new sentence we had to write in. But uh, the team were up and running. And our first virtual event was run on day three. Uh, and I know Teresa's on this call, and I, I, I shan't embarrass her or anybody else by saying that we've run over 100 since in the three month period. We've run more events through this virtual world than, than we ever did physically. And that's obviously because it is easier to do. Um, and the attendance levels have been brilliant um, and the feedback that we've had. So, so our, first, our first decisions were very much in terms of supporting our members, both from a financial point of view, but from an information point of view, um, and to ensure that they were having their voices heard in the corridors of power in Westminster via the British Chambers of Commerce uh, through, through our research work, which has been invaluable. Brilliant, mate. Thank you. Thank you for that one. And, and, and Sarah, come to you, um, if that's okay. Just a, a, a bit more specific question. You're, you're, you're very well established locally with both the local authorities and the local enterprise partnership. Do you, do you think that the, the Chambers had a good enough role in, in, the, in the, the lockdown process with those organisations in, in Staffordshire? Yeah, I think we've had a, I think we've, it's, it's worked really well as a partnership. I think it's been fantastic. I think we've all recognised what each, each of us can do and what we should be doing. So, for example, the County Council had an emergency grant fund uh, and they pushed out all of the sort of first bit, the triaging uh, element of that through my membership and Growth Hub team. So, uh, you know, that was a really good way of us showing in part, working in partnership with them. They thought it was fantastic and it meant that we processed, I think it was something like nearly 6,000 calls in two weeks. Um, to, to really get those businesses some extra little bits of, of top up money. It wasn't very much money, it wasn't very much grant money, uh, but it was a real emergency fund. Um, and I think that shows how we worked really well together. And also I think that what's, all, what's happened now as well is that they have recognised some of that work that we have done and what is coming down the line uh, and looking at the Chamber to start to deliver new projects, new programmes, new initiatives uh, to help support, for example, startup programmes. 
uh, which there's going to be a, a, an increased need for, uh, we suspect. So yeah, I think it's been a really good partnership and I'm, I'm really proud about how the team have worked. And it's not just a relationship that I have with the chief execs or the leaders or, or, the, or the chairman of the board. It's the fact that it goes all the way through the organisations so that my team would know everybody who need, they need to know in those different organisations now. And a lot of that work now means that it happens at an operational level and we just absorb it and get on with it. And I think that's worked brilliantly. Brilliant, thank you, thank you, Sarah. Um, Paul, I'll, I'll come back to you now, if, if that's all right. Um, our, our members and our local businesses are, are predominantly coming back to um, back to life now. Um, July the fourth is a big date. We're still waiting on swimming pools, aren't we? And, and, and gyms. You've got some big players um, in, in your membership. How, how do they feel? What, what 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 do they feel about actually coming back to work now? A, a mixture of, of, of fear and excitement, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think no. The whole unlock has been uneven, hasn't it, across businesses and different sectors, and so there's a whole variety of uh, feelings. And one of the points that uh, I've picked up a lot in conversations is that, that businesses want it to be fair, and those who aren't able to operate right now, and you know, you'd say you know, Birmingham Airport, things like the quarantine rule, which have come in and have a direct impact there, or you know, Louise mentioned hospitality in, in the broadest possible sense, so say the NEC, again, a massive um, driver of the regional economy, um, and they're not able to operate you know, conferences or exhibitions and have been pitching to be a test case for government and to say, look, we can run a socially uh, safe, socially distanced um, exhibition, let us prove it, and that then can be rolled out across the whole country. Haven't been able to do that yet. And so I think there's a frustration there. I think those who are able to come back, um, have been, I mean, people are, and this is a real positive, I think you know, businesses are consistently focusing on their people and making sure that, that their, their work environments are safe and that their staff feel confident and comfortable coming back. You know, it feels like people, there's lots of consultation going on and, um, you know, people being very transparent about, look, you know, this is what we need to do and how we need to get back up and running and we want you to be a part of it. This is the the commitment that we're making in terms of making that the workplace safe. So I think, um, you know, business is resilient. It always is, isn't it? And we'll find a way. You know, I would say that in certainly the recent sort of period, last couple of months, though, the government messaging has been pretty frayed around it. And even this week, the, the way that the comms came out about um, the 4th of July, well, the real guidance will follow. It, it's bitty and it's not giving businesses enough time to, to plan and that what we're seeing is a lot of just you know getting on with it anyway using common sense being smart um so you know that's sort of props to business i'm not sure um we're getting quite the uh the the, the, the sort of strength of leadership or guidance that, that we need albeit in a very very challenging time of course we all understand that but yeah no i think people want there's also that recognition though corin isn't there that it's not going to be just turn the taps back on it's a lot easier to lock down than it is to, to restart things. So we're sort of in for a, a certainly a reasonable haul to get back to where, uh, where we were pre-COVID. And that's on the basis as well that, that we don't get hit by a really uh, damaging second wave, of course. And um, looking around the world right now, you can see that those risks uh, are very real. And I think that we all need to take that seriously. Yeah, I agree. And I think from my experience, the same as yours, like all businesses want is the rules, isn't it? Tell us the rules and we'll, we'll get on with it. Um, and some really big, brave decisions, astonishing fast moves in HMRC to get payments out. Really, really brilliant. But now the details come in, it, it does feel frayed. I think that's a, that, that's a very good point. And that's where the confusion comes, doesn't it? So Sharon, just over to you. I mean, particularly in, in, in Hereford, Worcestershire, a lot of your more rural businesses must be incredibly worried about what this summer looks like, I'm taking it, about how they return to, to business as well. Yeah, I've turned the camera off, everyone. Um, I think I mentioned earlier digital issues. Um, I guess <laughs> that is um, related to the rural area. Um, and also, yeah, in relation to that, a big um, sector for Herefordshire and Worcestershire is, of course, tourism and hospitality. And we've all heard in the in the news, you know, about um, when those businesses can open up, etc. Um, but it's definitely been one of the sectors that has been the big challenge in Herefordshire and Worcestershire. 
those businesses um, and others. It's, it's safe to say it's not just that sector, but we found with some of our conversations, about 25% of businesses are basically classing themselves in survival or crisis mode, and a lot of those businesses are from that sector. So I guess it means there's been a lot of temporary closures, um, and we're really hopeful with the new rules um, and as they progress that those businesses will be able to start opening up. But the other thing we found as well, again, not just that, but across all the sectors, is that actually about 80% of businesses um, have ex expect their profits and their turnover to decrease. So I guess that's a figure that's not a surprise to, ev to everyone. Um, but a large proportion of that, 22%, expect that to be by more than 50%. So it's a huge amount of impact on turnover and profits. Um, like you say, Corinne, lots of that is to do with hospitality, tourism and being in a rural sector. And we've definitely had some winners too. We've had some great stories from businesses who've been um you know given contracts to help with ppe etc so there are a proportion that are growing but um it's definitely been a struggle for the region yeah i agree and i think the tourism industry in particular i think um one thing was one lockdown and coming back to work again um if there is a second spike if there's a second lockdown that will finish off a lot of our tourism businesses in the, in the west midlands which is a which is a, a real worry um, Louise, just to you about, about coming back from lockdown. I mean, Coventry is an area with such an amazing amount going on with the city of culture being prepared for the regeneration projects and the rebuilding of the city centre have been incredible. Do, do, how, how, how's life, how does it come back, business coming back to life again in Coventry at the moment? Which, which is a, a, great, a great segue to a couple of points um, that are slightly different to my colleagues. Um, and that is all about confidence, Corinne. So you bang on as we look um, to um, Coventry City of Culture and of course to the Commonwealth Games. Um, it is all about instilling confidence back into our communities and into our economy. And when we talk about confidence, um, this isn't just about business confidence, it's also about consumer confidence. So it's all the things that we're all involved with in terms of trying to encourage that spend again back out in the economy. Um, so, so instilling confidence is something that we can all play a part in because all of us as, as businesses, albeit chambers of commerce and not-for-profits, all of us should be talking up our region um, as we move forward over the next 12 months, two years, because yes, we know it's going to be a bumpy ride. And then just very quickly, a, a different point I wanted to make in terms of um, how we're supporting businesses is, um, you know, Chambers of Commerce, we, we're really good at offering support that, that isn't always delivered through our, ourselves. You know, we go out to all of you guys as our experts. So in Cobb Warwickshire, our businesses have had a lot of um, support from um, our big legal firm, Wright Hassel. They've had a lot of financial advice and support, all of which is pro bono from um, prime accountants, Burgess and Bullock. You know, we, we've been working with Hariba Myra, with Warwick Manufacturing Group. We're all really good at that working with you guys as businesses to then put put that support back out into um into our economy um but i think more than any more than anything corinne confidence is going to be key how we instill confidence in the economy going forward both as to consumer level and to business level and and again just so our clients on the call understand we're lobbying again really hard into government to say to government look You've got to provide a roadmap. You've got to give a route map um, to the economy, to businesses, so that we can work with that and people can see can see the way forward um, out of this. And and you know, whichever um, political party you decide to sit with, or all, all credit and well done to Andy Street, who has tried to do that in terms of launching this week the three point two billion pound ask in terms of how we recharge and regenerate um, the Midlands over the next three years. Thanks, Louise. And we'll, we'll, really important points. We'll come back onto those, those, those um, economic points in a moment as well. So excellent, thank you. Richard, you mentioned the, um, the, the importance of your market towns um, to, to, to your area. Um, I mean, retail is absolutely critical to, to those towns, whether it's from the, the council-owned shopping centres in Shrewsbury or the market towns of Oswestry or to Tenbury Wells. You've got, some, you've got some really big places to look after there. What, what, what do you, how's retail getting ready to come back or, or, or can it come back in, in, after lockdown? 
Uh, well, well, it can, but very much in a much different form, of course. I think initially there was a concern about cost in terms of how do I prepare my premises to handle the new world that we face, and, and they were incurring costs at a time when when income was obviously not there. But um, as they then got back in, there were there were more Murrays that had been registered with us. Things like, do I have a supply chain anymore? Um, can I source my products anymore or the services? You know, are the businesses I dealt with still there? Uh, and that was a major concern, of course. And consumer confidence, obviously, is is very much key, as Louise has already touched on, in terms of the high street. Uh, many of them were carrying stock that they had in March that when they closed down, uh, the stock probably not appropriate in many cases for this time of year. How do I how do I liquidate that but not make myself go uh, go into a really difficult situation? And of course, the big focus is the the cash element as well. Is is you know will I have enough customers to generate enough cash from from the work that I do? We know yesterday was I think was the uh, the rent day from from rental properties. Um, and you know the, the signs are there's going to be some fairly significant issues with, with no payments there because people just can't afford to do it. So there is an excitement, there is also a nervousness because there are so many unknowns uh, and I think government could and must do more in terms of having, having an extension of support mechanisms to understand that these, these businesses, as we've already said, will, will recover, but they will recover over a period of time, not instantly. The research that we've done uh, has been showing that, that uh, again, a high proportion of, of people, probably somewhere in the region, 32% of people who are who have staff furloughed are, are putting in place redundancy plans. Now, that's going to be a massive issue. Um, but those businesses, even on the high street, are going to need to upskill what they have got there to ensure that they can, can trade successfully. Um, and, and the final point, ingredient, of course, is the cash. It's the money. It's, it's cash flow. You know, retail is, is quite a cash guzzler at the end of the day. Uh, and it, it's it's ensuring that they've got the financial support and as a chamber like like many of us we we've embraced the chamber finance package which is really really important for our businesses going forward chamber finance finder and would encourage everybody on the on the call today to take a good look at that and share it with their with their colleagues because it's it's going to be an important part of uh, economic sustainability as we go on thanks Richard. And i think as far as retail goes if the trafford center something the profile and size of traffic center become unviable and close, close down i think there's no safety net anywhere in the in the retail sector at the moment um sarah come to you i mean like like the black country staffordshire as manufacturing it's in its veins doesn't it um and they have particular problems coming back from lockdown because clearly if you've got a production line you know you can't have only half a production line on you have to have everybody on the shop floor don't you so the costs for manufacturing are difficult is that what your members are telling you yeah, I mean, there, there are, no, um, and we've got some brilliant companies, who, big, big manufacturing names like JCB and uh, Michelin, who have done great plans to get back to work and have shared that with some of the smaller manufacturers as well, so that people can learn from, from, from their experiences. But yes, it is a real issue. Um, and for some of the smaller manufacturers who, who um, Staffordshire is weird in that a lot of the manufacturing companies are actually quite in quite residential areas. So they have uh, particular licenses. And one of the issues is that if you're doing if you need more people and you need to extend your shift patterns, then actually how do you change your licenses? So there's a whole bit of sort of legislation and regulation around how businesses need to operate. Um, and we're lobbying the local authorities really hard to make sure that they understand that. But of course, it's also quite difficult because you could have, as we have in, in uh, one part of Stoke, we have a really good uh, manufacturer um, uh, right next to a, a, a housing estate where we've got lots of people working from home and all of a sudden the noise there is completely different than they were expecting. So there are some of those sorts of tensions that we're finding about, uh, about all of that. Manufacturers though, the real issue is supply chain. It's getting the goods for the uh, pottery companies at the moment. One of the real problems is getting enough clay uh, and you know th it's those sorts of issues which are really hampering manufacturing at the moment. Uh, they can work out ways and be resilient and imaginative about how they will support their workforce with the right PPE and the right ways of working. But if you can't get the raw materials, then it is really going to hamper us a lot. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to take a couple of questions from the, from the, the, the um, attendees, that's all right. If you wouldn't mind having a crack at the first question, it's about, it's about um, returning to the office. Um, if anybody else wants to add to what Sarah's got, give me a wave and I'll call you in. I won't go for everybody because it'll, it'll get a little bit restricted. Dean, Dean, are you on the, on, on, on the line, mate? Do you want to unplug yourself and... Um, and ask a question about our office workers returning. Yeah, so uh, my question really is is just about uh, the fact that we, we're a manufacturing business, so we've got half of our employees working in the office, and we've got our engineering, sales, finance, and other back office functions working from home. 
I think my question is, is that the government's announcements don't really give any steer on when those people that are currently working from home can return to the office. And one of the challenges that we have is that although we have a number of people that can work from home, I think the level of productivity uh, will vary depending on the types of role that you do. So for example, our engineering guys will never be as productive as at home as they would be you know, collaboratively working in the office. Um, so I just wondered whether there was any steer coming out of government around when that guidance um, potentially would change uh, or whether there's anything that we can do from a lobbying perspective to try and obtain more clarity on it. Um, well, we've taken the approach really, Dean, um, about, so we've come back to work. We, there is absolutely no need for us to go back into the office, uh, but we've taken the approach that we are exactly as you've said, that productivity changes. Um, and we've all gone through the period of crisis where everybody worked really hard from home, delivered a whole range of, range of things. We're now in this sort of odd, weird phase of sort of no man's land. Um, so we're bringing people back on a, um, a sort of rolling program, but also on the basis that we're bringing people back to collaborate. So it's much less about, um, uh, we don't do the work in the office. We actually have a good social time. We collaborate, we plan, and then we go home to do the work. Um, and I think it's getting, getting that sort of balance. The government guidelines is still a little bit confused, but if you, if you are a COVID-19 safe workplace and you uh, have all of those social distancing and uh, uh, facilities in place, I mean, we've got more hand sanitizers than boots, I think, at the moment, to be honest, to make sure that everyone feels safe. Um, but because they feel safe, they are actually now enjoying coming back into work. And I think that that driving productivity and making your business safe is starting to take the most important, is, is more of, of a priority really than following government guidelines, which as my colleagues have said, are rather confused on, on, on some of this. Um, so my advice, what it's worth, would be do what you need to do for your business, but make sure that your, your staff feel incredibly safe. Yeah, and very quickly, we, we have a full COVID safe workplace because we've maintained our operations, um, you know, our factory operations throughout. I think we're part of a US uh, corporate business uh, who are very keen to ensure we follow government guidance. And because the guidance is, if you can work from home, you should. I think that's where um, there is that lack of clarity. And, and that's the bit that is the, the barrier currently. Yeah, and that's where we've taken it, that yes, we expect people to go and to do the work from home, but actually collaboration, problem solving, being creative, planning what needs to be done is often better done as a team. Um, and there needs to be ways in which you can bring people back. And I actually think, I wonder if that's, how, that's what the future of work will be. Um, and the, the place of work will be more like that. And work will be, if you can do it from home, people will carry on wanting to work from home. And, and uh, Dean, I think um, manufacturers have a much clearer idea of what productivity is as well for, for workers, don't they? In most offices, they can lose an hour if they run out of tea bags. So, um, but, <laughs> but um, for yourself, Richard, you were going to come in as well, weren't you? Yeah, just, just to, to, to add a point, really, and I think Sarah's co covered much of it off quite eloquently. And yeah, the guidance is work from home if you can, but also, you know, you, you have to be able to be to be functioning. Um, uh, and obviously, from a manufacturing point of view, that's that's something which which you must make a local decision on. And I would say this, wouldn't I keep in touch with your local chamber because we will have the latest information instantly as it comes out. Uh, to support you in guidance. I think the other point we also need to recall is, is the fact that the, the loss of social interaction with our staff has, has had an impact on mental health well-being and, and as a chamber we've been very focused on that right from day one. We could see what would happen and bringing people together once again and getting them back into the, the social world I think is really really important if we are to, to strengthen their, their mental capacity and their willingness to, to work together and collaborate. I was just going to come in so you know it's a it's a good point we hear it a lot Dean and I think that I think we've got to accept we're not going to get um, lots of clarity from government you know it's the messaging that's coming through and again we heard it earlier this week it's going to be around judgment the let the British people use their common sense etc etc and I think um, that's something that we have to a little bit make peace with and then I would just emphasize speaking and talking really clearly with your people, you know, and I think that all of the, the, the businesses are going to flourish here is by having open, honest conversations, talking about, you know, what, what you need to make the business survive and then thrive, isn't it? And sort of the more you can get everyone on that same page, then that's going to start, hopefully people will recognize what they need to do and, and 
uh, what they'll need, you know, you as a leader to do to make the workplace safe. But I think businesses who are really close and tight and everyone's on that same page will have the best way of coming through, recognizing that we're not going to get that really clear rule book on absolutely everything. It's going to be a bit vague and a bit piecemeal and um, a bit frustrating. Brilliant. Thank, thank, thank you, Dean, for that question. It's excellent. Um, Paul, um, stay alert, because the next question I'm going to call in, I know you've been, in, been involved with as well. Um, Vicky Wilkes, you're, you're, on, you're on the line at the moment, Vicky, aren't you? Could you introduce a bit about your business and, and, and ask us all your questions? Yes, sorry, if I can unmute. Um, I think I was trying to do it at the same time as host. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, I, I've, I've sent a couple in, so I'm going to assume this is the second one. My business is um, a live entertainment venue. It's Red by Night. Um, and finally, for the hospitality sector, we've got some guidance, which is, which is great. Um, but it's still got a ban on, on live music. Um, and we're not being allowed to assess that. Um, but, but I suppose my question is, obviously there's large sections that have now been given guidance, be that great guidance or intermittent guidance or unclear guidance, but we've got it. But obviously there's still things like the live musicians, there's things like driving instructors, there's a lots of bits and pieces that are not yet being addressed or haven't been given clarity. I suppose my question to the Chambers is, who is keeping the the record of which sectors haven't yet been given their their clarity their opening dates when they can go back to work and and my concern is that there's a risk that when there's just those little pockets of things that are left that kind of pressure and the level of attention that's being given to the big sections is is in danger of sort of being left on the shelf or just so really i suppose it's an operational question to the chambers are you keeping a record of which people haven't been given the information yet? And how are you going to keep applying the pressure and the attention to make sure that everybody's sort of dealt with in time? I so say, obviously, for me, it's the live entertainment, but I also know a lot of my friends are going, well, we still haven't been given any information or even mentioned up till now. So, so really, that's, that's the question. It's a great question. Isn't it? I mean, I was, I totally agree with you. And it's, you know, that's where the lobbying piece comes in. I mean, we've produced a report, we called it Mind the Gap, which was doing exactly what you said, Vicky, of, of sort of flagging up those who have been left behind or omitted from the, the various government support schemes. And, um, you know, that's been a fluid document because it's changed over time. And you, know, you mentioned, you know, um, certainly sort of live entertainment we heard it, it yesterday you know swimming pools and the like which really have uh have in, in some ways done a very good job of of lobbying and bringing that that to bear and so a track is being kept you know by you know by us as what's going on on the local level and we're feeding that into local regional national stakeholders we have a call with the uh, the west midlands mayor uh, every thursday afternoon and um you know, these points are constantly being made and then being fed into government um, and equally I know I'm sure colleagues as well have been on calls with secretaries of state and and the like so I think that they know it's not as if oh we forgot about that um, but it's uh, you know it, it's tricky to know some of the decision making that is being um, that is taking place in government I mean just I mentioned briefly like the airports before and the quarantine rule but you know, where you might think that was Department of Transport who was uh, leading on that. It's actually been the Home Office and the decisions to impose the quarantine rules were made without really consulting with airports and the aviation industry, which seems madness to me. And I think yeah. the first review of that isn't going to take place until uh, next week and they'll start sort of allowing a few air bridges. But you do sort of wonder, it doesn't make sense. And all you can do is keep banging home and banging home some of the issues because we will get hit by the reality. There will be layoffs, there will be redundancies uh, in areas where they're not being allowed to get back to work, which goes back to the point I mentioned about sort of fairness earlier. Brilliant, and Louise, you, you want to come in? 
Yeah, just very quickly, um, bang on, Vicky. Um, as soon as they announced that pubs and hairdressers were opening <laughs> as of next week, the worry was that then we take the eye off, um, eye off the ball in terms of some of our, our other sectors. And, and certainly this particular sector is important to all of us, but as you can imagine in Cobb Warwickshire, where we have um, Stonely, NAEC, Coombe Abbey, and where of course we're heading towards City of Culture 2021, which is predicated on the centre of Coventry City being um, one big open live music, live showcasing place. Um, this is absolutely on our mind in terms of getting clarity um, and guidance um, from the government and as Paul says also using opportunities as we do to to lobby for that clarity and that guidance what I would say Corinne um, to any of our, our, um, our colleagues um, in business is also come to us with ideas and solutions because where we where we lobby where we influence it is often um, it's often better placed and better received where we take because they don't they don't often think of the solutions where we take to government and and our local authority colleagues some of the ideas and solutions for opening up so for example very quickly um, in Warwickshire the the very practical sensible common sense concept of letting independent traders spill out onto their streets in a very safe way to allow better trading that actually came from from people who sit on our um, chamber branch committees it came from the business community to sort of say well this is a solution and this would help us move forward and trade mm -hmm. so please please if you've got ideas bring them to your chambers because we do have our influ influencing roots yeah we, think right, we always know someone don't we between us <laughs> which is the reality of it sarah to, over to you yeah, just very briefly, because um, I've just done some work on this with one of our live music venues in Stoke. Um, and I would suggest if you haven't already to contact the Music Venue Trust, because they're really putting a lot of pressure on government uh, for specifically around music venues and live music. And I think one of the other issues about all of that is that um, I think in the guidance for in the hospitality sector, it actually says that not only can you not have live music in pubs and clubs and bars, but you might not even be able to have recorded music either uh, because it makes people shout. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so there are some really, really odd little bits within the government uh, guidelines on a whole range of things that um, if you keep us informed, as, as Louise says, come up with ideas, come up with solutions. But I also suggest that you lobby well with the, your trade, trade bodies because as the, uh, you know, the more that we can all talk together and can support each other to, to represent businesses, then, the, then government will pay attention. So yeah. use all routes available. I think, I think the frustration from our point of view is that it's, this, it's the blanket policy. So I can understand the logic behind not wanting people to be shouting over music and dancing together with regards to the recorded music you know i'm prepared to risk assess that and say as long as it's background music but our venue's got a four meter by six meter stage i could have an acoustic set on that where i control the volume of the music and it's live background but we haven't been given the option to risk us we, we're told that we, we've got an idiot's guide to having hand sanitizer every two foot basically and signs telling people how to wash their hands but we haven't been given the the ownership of risk assessing things like I, I believe that we could very safely. So that's the frustration. It's like we're kind of being, I suppose, treated like children um, with blanket policies. And, and there is a difficult balance between having standardization and then having things kind of all, all over the place. But but that that's. Yeah, it's just for sure. But I, I appreciate the idea about the um, the trade body that, that I will take that up. And I, I'm sorry, just come back on that just briefly, Karen. I think that's exactly the point, Vicky, that that um, the government isn't trusting business to actually, you know, businesses, you all take risks all the, all the time. You are really, we're all really adept at making risk assessments on a range of different things. The government seems to be so risk averse, and I can understand why, but it's not prepared to trust the common sense of the business population to, to, uh, to manage that effectively. And I agree with you. I think that's one of the, the real, real faults in the way that the government have dealt with some of the guidelines. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you very much, Vicky. And we'll, we'll, we'll always have you back as well, mate, because you've got a great venue there. Um, oh. uh, Louise, I'm just going to warn you, I'll come to you for this next question, if that's all right. Um, 
Richard, Richard Mayfrey's on, on, on the line with a, with a question about the balance of online events and face-to-face -face events. Are you there, Richard? I am, yeah. If someone could uh, maybe turn my camera on, because I can't. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really um, exactly as you said, Corin. Thank you. I mean, we've all we've all um, we've all been um, you know, conducting a lot of business online via VTC webinars and so on, like we're doing now. Um, and, yeah, and for, and for us, for the West Midlands RSVA, um, engagement is a huge part of, of what we do. It's uh, you know, it's, it's about a sort of third of our of our um, overall output. Um, and I think what we found, we've learned quite a lot about it. Some of our activity, I think, has been quite effective uh, in terms of um, pe you know, people attending events. Clearly, uh, there's a massively reduced cost. Uh, yeah, and, and you save a lot of time um, in terms of travel, you know, for, you know, for, for, for example, and all, and all the sort of benefits around that. But th th there's no doubt that there's real value as well in sort of face-to-face -face contact at times. And I just wonder, you know, looking ahead, you know, perhaps as we, as we you know, eventually, hopefully, as we sort of start to come out of this completely, you know, maybe 12, 18 months away, uh, where do people think the balance, you know, might, might lie in future? I, um, I, just to respond, I do think that we will find, um, and perhaps all of us differently in some ways, depending on the kind of um, businesses that we're involved with or we're delivering, I do think that in a new norm, we will find natural balances between online activity and face-to-face -face activity. Um, I, I was listening um, on a call yesterday, on an event yesterday, where, you know, I, I heard those dreaded words of Zoom fatigue starting to creep in. Um, and then that sends alerts in my head in terms of, oh my goodness, if, if we've got Zoom fatigue creeping in or Microsoft Teams fatigue creeping in, um, then in the new norm, the new norm isn't just about trying to find the next best way of online activity. Um, as you say, um, Richard, it is about trying to find that balance. Um, and then again, um, just last week, um, and it's a local authority led meeting actually, um, we've already made the decision in August um, that at one of our, our larger partnership kind of meetings, 20, 30 people, we are going to go back together face to face. Um, and I know that might sound odd to everybody, but it's almost what we want to do is send out some confident messages um, and um, some upbeat messages about the art of the possible, that in fact we can do that, we can do it safely, we can do it in a safe distance kind of way, as long as we find the right, um, the right space, the right venue, and we think it through. Um, and I think we will see more of that because you, you bang on Richard, um, you, ca you can't beat it really, can you? You cannot beat that face-to-face -face connectivity and networking and everything that is involved in that um, versus online, but that's not to that's not to in any way put down the amazing online activity that we're all involved in now. Um, and all credit um, to some of my colleagues um, who are going out. And um, Paul yesterday in Greater Birmingham, they delivered their global trade conference online. Um, and and again in Birmingham, I know Paul's going to go ahead with um, their big their huge awards dinner, which normally attracts something like twelve hundred clients as a chamber dinner. So it's all the art of the possible, and I think we'll all find our ways of doing it and a new norm. Um, and I think there will have to be a balance, definitely. And Sharon, coming over to you. Hi, Sharon. Did you, did you want to add into this one? Yeah, sorry, I was just trying to turn the video off. Um, yeah, we definitely already decided to carry on with some of our online activities. Um, and that was mostly from feedback from, again, some of the really rural companies in, in Herefordshire where they haven't actually been able to access some of our training, um, sorry, our services, particularly training, um, just really due to the travel. So I think we've already decided that some of the time savings we've made, um, some of the um, carbon savings that we'll make, some of the productivity and the efficiency savings we'll make, and we'll definitely carry on with some of our online activities. But that said, like Louise, we're so looking forward to going back to some face-to-face -face events where some of that discussion around the table 
absolutely we've used online to do it but it hasn't been the same we've found in some situations as face to face so what we're ultimately planning to do is have choice for our customers and that's the most important thing for us going forward that we've actually now got more choice for customers and it's just one of the learning things that we're going to take from the crisis Thank, thank you, Sharon. Um, Anna on, on the line from Paycare. Anna, um, not, your question was quite similar. It's just uh, back at you, Anna. Um, you, you mentioned how do we see networking in chambers for the, for the next sort of 12 months. Do, do some of the things the panelists have been talking about um, resonate with you? Yeah, certainly. I think it, from our perspective, obviously, we, we love getting out there. We just love um, getting out and networking kind of in the region. So across the borders as well it's nice to see uh, the link between the chambers that's why this webinar is so useful to actually see how we can all work together and as patrons of uh, black country and members of a couple of the other chambers i think it's important for us to keep that connection going with other members other patrons and with the chamber themselves so yeah certainly a lot of that will be really interesting to see how that balance of online and offline works out um, yeah see that in the future we're doing similar with our mental health training that we have a balance of online and face-to-face -face, um coming but it's kind of getting to that point and finding that right balance and i think yeah it'll be interesting to see over the coming months i think thank you um and we, we, we've all we're saying thank you much anna we, we've almost run out of time now um and we've, we've loads of questions we haven't had to get through that's just been amazing which i think is just testament that we should do this again probably in a on a much more regular basis if um if, if we can one of the benefits we found about about doing zooms it's not we do need to get to, to cuddle people again at some stage um but actually the, these sort of things are much easier to organize when you've only got to get an hour of your day house rather than getting somewhere um there's um just a sort of final question from me and then i um, apologize to all the people who had, who had left questions didn't get around to answering we I, I will share them with the um with the with the, the speakers as well if they want to reply with them we'll get that out just to sort of tie things up really um a uh, really big difficult time coming up in the next 12 months for everyone with, with a recession and things that are going to be going on for all the people on the call at the moment if you are chambers have never ever needed you more than ever and i can honestly tell you that you've never needed chambers more than you ever will do in the next 12 months so whoever you join just join one of us you know make sure you're part of this amazing network we get on really really well as six chief execs and six, six chambers we we share an awful lot i wouldn't be able to do this job without all of my friends around on this call when i first started three years ago i learned so much from all of them so thank you all for that just to finish off with, really, um, uh, I just wanted a, 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 a one or two um, really quick points from each of you on, on your vision for the next 12 months, things that, that, that you are going to be focused on. Um, for me, I'll, start, I'll kick this off. I want to do more of this with you lot because I think the more that we work together, we do a brilliant job together, which is, which is brilliant. And the second bit is shifting more of our stuff online. You know, I do want the face-to-face -face stuff, but we've got to channel shift a lot of our a lot of our stuff online for the next 12 months. Sarah, I'll come to you quickly for a couple of your focuses for the next 12 months. Uh, members, 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 uh, but also looking fresh, different, coming out of this, uh, not not being the same chamber that we went into it because the world has changed and we need to reflect that. And my third uh, point really is I think that. Uh, whether there's a wave, the second wave or not, there are a whole range of uh, ripples that we will feel from this for, for a number of years. So making sure that we are helping businesses to be able to face whatever, they, whatever comes in the future. And my big thing really, as you know, is climate change. I think there's going to be a whole load of stuff that happens around climate change that we need to help businesses uh, take on board. So I'm trying to forward think for the next 12 months. Thank you, mate. Um, Richard. A uh, number of key focuses for us, Corin. Uh, obviously, we know businesses are going to need finance. They're going to need money as we go through this. So it's really important that we, we support access to that in whatever way we possibly can. Uh, businesses are made up of workforce. The support of the workforce in terms of skills, you know, with it, we know there's going to be reductions in headcount. Businesses will need to be smarter in the way they go about things. They'll need that, that skills support in order for them to actually manage to do that. So a, re a real focus around that, um, but also we're going to understand that those people who are out of work are going to need to be matched to those businesses that need them in Shropshire, particularly as a rural community. We have to avoid the talent drain. It, it's so important that we hang on to our skills. So connecting those people and using technology based tools, which we as a chamber actually have to do that is, is really, really important. And at the end of the day, our third, our third part I would suggest is, is making sure the voice of Shropshire business is heard. 
making sure that those policy makers, those decision makers, understand that in rural communities, the world is a, di a bit different and we need you to, to address that. Um, uh, I think one final plea as well, which, which I think everybody needs to understand, we are working on as a network, is that we will see outbreaks, we will probably see lo local lockdown, and businesses need to have the confidence that there are support packages at a local level to ensure that they can be sustainable if they have to face a further lockdown. And government needs to actually come to the table with something that will ensure that happens. Otherwise, unfortunately, we'll see people not declaring if they have a case or two. So, uh, that's my... Everyone else has only got one second now because Richard's focused so long, but Louise, if you're... <laughs> Okay, my one second would be um, members, 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 um, let's trade up, let's trade out of this downturn. Supporting young people is a biggie um, for our Chamber of Commerce. And then lastly, um, making the most of City of Culture accolade. Yay! Brilliant, mate. And, and, and Louise, I'm, I'm Sharon. Yeah, members first for us, um, consultation so that we can be driven by the needs of our members and not anybody else. Um, definitely services online, um, working together the six chambers, we've already started that. So um, getting rid, I think that's what technology and Zoom has taught us, is getting rid of those borders and um, you know, regionally, absolutely, we can do so much. Um, and I'm going to throw social value in there as well as my last one. Thank you, mate. And Paul? Yeah, I mean, there's lots that everyone said already, but uh, I think the, the recovery, Brexit, is going to hit us uh, at the end of the year. Um, from our perspective, Commonwealth Games, and also I think the independent nature of Chambers is crucial in speaking truth to power is going to be really, really important and being prepared to get our elbows out. And, um, you know, even some of the stuff we've heard today, we need to make sure that those messages are clear, use our voice, use our uh, profile and, and sort of positioning to challenge. You know, and you look at the impact that, you know, Marcus Rashford, young footballer, had in making things change. Well, we need to sort of um, learn from that. And, you know, while we can be collegiate with government where we need to be, we represent business and businesses. And we've got to make sure that we are... Uh, absolutely shouting loudly when needed. Brilliant, thank you. We didn't get to talk about inclusivity, about, about infrastructure investment, about international trade. There's questions we didn't get through. We do a, a lot as a network. We're nothing without you, our members. So thank you all for joining this morning. So our panelists, give yourself a clap, please. That was absolutely brilliant. We will do this again if everyone agrees, because it's been really, really entertaining and I've enjoyed it. So thank you all very much. Sorry we overran and we'll speak soon. Bye. Bye everybody. Bye everyone.